Our next speaker is Troy Saltiel, and he is going to be talking to us about mapping and identifying people first streets. Um, do you want to roam? I think I'll roam. Otherwise, you end up standing back and you can't hear anything. Uh, but thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Troy Saltiel. Uh, I'm representing an organization called Sweet Streets here in Salt Lake City. And I'm really kind of uh, giving an overview of like an idea that we have uh, for using the open street map data for our purposes. So I just want to start off with what Sweet Streets is. Uh, so we're a nonprofit advocacy organization based out of Salt Lake City uh, that advocates for people first, sweet streets and public spaces. And so we're a group of all volunteer community members. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background on how I ended up here at this conference. Uh, so I live here, of course. Uh, I went to the University of Utah and got my master's here in geography. So I'm very, very local. Uh, but I got involved with OpenStreetMap probably six years ago. Um, but I had a different board member with Sweet Streets uh, come approach me because he heard I had a spatial background. And my first suggestion was that OpenStreetMap probably provides at least a database for us to kind of work on doing something like this. So what is a people first or sweet street? So I'll start calling it sweet street. Uh, so the first thing is that it's welcoming to all, uh, and it provides safe mobility options for all ages and abilities. And one big thing would be that it could provide or provide connection or access to needs and amenities. Uh, so that could be your grocery stores, your shops, your third spaces, and other things like parks. Uh, Consider some neighborhood context and desire of a community. Uh, and of course, that would have to be balanced or distributed. Uh, that way there's, there's not a bunch of things uh, pretty much focused in one area, not another neighborhood, uh, places to congregate and engage. Uh, and then like one of the big core things of this is that it follows these general principles, but it's not a static thing. Uh, you have to recognize that Salt Lake City does not have the same exact ideals of somewhere else in the world or the country or even Utah. Uh, so why map uh, people first, uh, sweet streets? Uh, the, the big idea here is to help communities achieve their vision of a sweet street. Uh, so we'd like to produce a tool which can lay the groundwork for identifying sweet streets. Uh, so we want it to be usable by communities everywhere. So some kind of tool that really is accessible and easy to understand and makes sense to the layperson. Um, and we want it to be something that's like, you can kind of point out a street and say, this street is sweet, this one is not. And I'll have some examples of uh, where we see that. And some people on the walking tour yesterday can well recognize the areas that I look at. Uh, and another thing would be that it would be adapted to the local context again, but it could be used by a range of users. So this could be city government uh, employees, advocacy groups like, like us, uh, community councils, or curious community members. And I would count you as that, those curious community members. Uh, so I don't think I need to really explain this slide because I think you're, you all know these things since you're here. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to do was kind of walk through uh, some examples of streets in Salt Lake City and kind of show what they look like in urban street map and kind of get uh, some context. Uh, so this first street I'm looking at is 300 South Main Street. Main Street is zero east or west, just for your, your context. Uh, and I'm also kind of pointing to where this picture was taken on OpenStreetMap. Uh, but this area is referred to as the Broadway B Business District. And if you're using an, an unnamed mapping platform that's not OpenStreetMap, it might actually label the street as Broadway instead of 300 South. Um, so this, this area was originally five lanes, uh, but the center walkway that you may see today was added about 15 years ago. And then the bike lane you're seeing there is added about 10 years ago. Uh, so this was kind of an area running through downtown. There's lots of businesses, there's lots of people moving around. And so for that reason, I would call what the street is now a sweet street and what it was before not a sweet street because it wasn't meeting the needs of the community. And now it's better reflecting it. Uh, another thing is that the tracks light rail that you've seen, the one that comes up here, uh, at least at this spot, that red line tree doesn't connect to this. Uh, but the, the tracks light rail itself does run through this street as well. So taking a look at a not so sweet street. So this is on like the southern end of town. And we did a walking tour back in May uh, with some folks from around the community. 
uh, but this area has uh, lots of different businesses and amenities here. Uh, there's, there's actually a frequent bus service here. There's our biggest transit center, Central Point Station, that has all the tracks, light rail uh, trains run right through it. And this is you exiting out of this light rail station. Um, so the, I would say this is not a sweet street. Uh, it curbs tight sidewalks. Uh, there's high speed traffic and it's just generally not friendly. There's no, uh, not really any shade there. So on a day like today, you'd be very unhappy walking on the street. So the next thing I was kind of thinking about uh, was about how would we kind of capture the community vision. And then I realized that these things already exist because lots of cities kind of had these neighborhood plans. Uh, so I wanted to look at two different plans uh, specific to some streets. Uh, and this street is 900 south, 200 west. And again, if you're on the walking tour, this is completely unrecognizable to you. Uh, so this, this was in 2011. It was just the road with pretty much no destinations on it. And then in 2016, and this plan kind of is, this kind of progressed over time. So this is not like the only plan that has come out. Uh, but this plan and figure that I'm showing you here is from 2016. And it kind of shows this kind of general idea of what the neighborhood would look like. So businesses, people everywhere, uh, accommodating different users and more trees. And then moving to today, uh, this, this is what it looks like now on the top left. Uh, so they, they generally did achieve that vision. Uh, the trees are still very young, so it does not quite look like how they drew it out. And the community is still developing. It's really only been 10 years, uh, so you only build so many buildings and change the street uh, that, you know, that fast. And I also show like a representation of it on OpenStreetMap. Uh, so looking at another street, uh, you probably have interacted with this street if you've been downtown, but this is State Street. Uh, this is in 2016. And for State Street, uh, they had a plan that they called the Life on State Plan. Uh, so that the two top figures kind of provided these like low to medium uh, investment options. Uh, and then the bottom is their full implementation. That's more what, what I would call like a community vision. So that, that's kind of their ideal based on this plan. Uh, so today, uh, not really much has changed. Uh, I, the picture that you're seeing is in the same exact spot and they just added a push button crosswalk. Uh, but there is one spot where they actually are changing things that would be in that kind of moderate investment uh, stage. Uh, and that's between 6th South and 7th South. So they're kind of building that wider sidewalk area and adding trees and other things. And that area is kind of crumbling before. It was kind of crazy that that was part of our downtown uh, in the state that it was. So how do we kind of capture the feel of the street? And the feel of the street is, is qualitative, whereas uh, OpenStreetMap data is just, it's just a pile of data if you're trying to load in all the information uh, from OpenStreetMap. Uh, but a big thing is that it's a safe and comfortable travel space. So there's this whole interaction of vehicle speeds, separation between different users in the street, uh, the width of the sidewalk, bike lanes, and vehicle lanes, the accessibility of the sidewalks and bike lanes, uh, the amenities that are there, so I mentioned trees and shade, but also benches, maybe bike parking. Uh, we even saw these interesting little tables that invite you to just hang out on the street and drink your coffee right on the street. There's some new developments that have that now. Uh, frequent safe crossings, so that's more about your walkability. And you, again, you've experienced already that our blocks are really huge here, so if you don't have that, um, it's, it's not, you know, it's very difficult to kind of get around. Uh, and then visual interest would be a big thing. So kind of like art, a uh, mixture of uses or building types, uh, surfaces and landscaping. Uh, and then kind of a distinct neighborhood feel and identity and kind of incorporating historical context and really contribute to that. So I wanted to point out one tool that I thought was really cool. Uh, it doesn't provide quite what we're looking for. I think we're asking for a lot when we're trying to work on the tool that I'm, I'm describing. Uh, but this tool is really interesting because it kind of provides uh, this interface where it's interactive. So it kind of uh, gets to that kind of community vision type of aspect. Uh, but this tool allows you to put in up to six destinations. And the idea is that you're getting a map generated that's about like how long would it take for you to use that travel mode to get there. And so with this one, a lot of them I selected as walking. 
uh, uh, but this kind of shows you what it would look like in this situation. And I highlighted church and state for you, for those of you that were there last night. Uh, also, I want to point out that close.city is the actual URL, so it's not just the name. So you can type that in, and you can make uh, your own of this in your own city. Uh, but one really interesting thing, and uh, I'll give you some context too. Church and state is there in that box with the arrow on it. Uh, I think to your left, uh, that's downtown, and you'll see that it's all kind of red. Uh, the reason for that is because I have supermarkets in there, and surprisingly, there's literally one supermarket uh, in downtown, and it's on the very northeast corner. And so this is just this analysis here is highlighting some like a need of the community, and that's that there's no supermarkets downtown, and it's very difficult if you're the walk uh, to get uh, go to a supermarket downtown. Uh, so, and kind of uh, thinking about this tool, I think outlining it is kind of a good idea. Uh, if you don't outline things, then you might end up not considering certain aspects of like, like a tool or analysis. Uh, so the first thing I would think of is defining the goals and the vision of the community. So like really that's the first step. Uh, and then starting with the existing OpenStreetMap data to see where you can prioritize your analysis or improvements. Uh, maybe select some streets or neighborhoods because as you would know, mapping uh, an open street map can be pretty labor intensive and stuff like map roulette is really, really useful for, for that. But this would be even beyond that. Uh, so you could explore your mapping options in the open street map and that would likely include uh, field mapping and verification. And then you'd run your analysis and kind of check and make sure that what you did makes sense. At the, is the data you collected actually helping you uh, realize uh, the goals and vision of the community? And then kind of setting up an action plan. Uh, but with that, I think I have some extra time. So if there are any questions, uh, thanks for listening and kind of hanging out towards the end of the day here. Um, I have a question that um, about the close the close city yeah. tool you said if you type that in you have access to what what comes up when you do that can you be, give us some more details yeah so close that city it should I don't know where geographically it pops up but or or if it even like if it opens like an interface like that but you really can just enter an area or zoom to an area and then that, those destinations that you see, uh, there are uh, kind of like, those are like click down boxes so you can change uh, how you're moving and what your destinations are. And so there's a whole list uh, between different categories. And I guess for simplicity, they only let you do six. Because this is choosing, uh, this is displaying uh, the one that takes the longest time. So the more you add, the whole map will look red probably. Is it uh, national? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. To make you Um. Thanks. I really liked your like delineation or thinking about how you use qu this quantitative data like qualitatively. Um, I really, there was a cool presentation earlier that I actually missed, so I might totally be off the board, but I was just thinking about like natural language matching and pulling in like interesting language or kind of like broader context. I don't know how rich the, the kind of like micro mapping in Salt Lake City is, but um, yeah, I just, I'm curious what approaches you're taking to kind of pulling in that qualitative information. Yeah, I, I think there's, a, I don't know if there would be like an approach to mapping. I think it's what you prioritize for mapping. Uh, so if you're focused more on safety, then maybe you are focusing on like the sidewalk widths and the buffers and speeds and other things like that. Uh, OpenStreetMap even has like traffic calming. Uh, I've added traffic calming, of course, <laughs> in Salt Lake City. Uh, so I guess it would depend on what you're focusing on. Uh, I think the qualitative aspects would more be more about how you kind of slice and dice the qual the quantitative data in OpenStreetMap. So I, I think that's kind of how you would end up tying things together. Um, but yeah, it, it would be something along those lines. 
Um, okay, one more question. So a lot of your renderings for sweet streets have a lot of trees. Are you consciously thinking about um, shade and sun protection in your planning? And if not, would you think about that in terms of reducing skin cancer risk? Yeah, so I, I, would, I would say like shade and trees would be like a pretty top priority in Salt Lake because as you know, it's pretty hot here in the summer. And there is a huge difference with the, the desert air. If you're in the shade, it feels way cooler generally. Uh, I should have also put a link. Uh, we were participating in like an urban heat island study last year, and I think all that data is publicly available. I think it's on actually heat.gov if you want to look that up. And there's a, there are multiple cities, so maybe your city's on there. Uh, but it's pretty clear where there are not that many trees and where there's a lot of impervious surface in Salt Lake if you look on that the map on heat.gov. Uh, so that that would be, I think, a pretty top priority. And I think in most people's vision, like the desirable neighborhoods here have these beautiful, like old, old trees and the entire street is shaded over. And I would imagine that most would want that. Uh, but this, the city itself, and I don't have any affiliation with the city, uh, but they are trying to plant more trees and all of their new uh, projects are adding trees generally to the street. Yeah, thank all you. All right, thanks.